Positive voltages are often used in electronic circuit design. But sometimes we need also negative voltages, for example when we use operational amplifiers or ADCs. This can be done by different ways. The obvious idea is to just change the polarity of our power supply, but this is not possible all the time, especially if we want to use non-isolated converters. We also want to talk about primary switched mode power supplies. This kind of power supplies are heavily used in modern electronics. The small chargers for your mobile phone would not be possible without this technology. If you haven't seen our previous videos about power supplies, we recommend you to watch them first. You find the links in the video description. If we have a simple battery supply and want a negative voltage, all we have to do is to reverse the two poles. If we use a second battery, we can make a dual supply. The same works with isolated power supplies. With non-isolated power supplies, it's not always that easy. Just think about how you would connect the different ground potentials. But fortunately, we have a lot of circuits to work with. In the first video about linear voltage supplies, we have seen a lot of topologies to build positive voltage regulators. For negative voltage regulators, the principle stays the same. The excess energy is converted into heat by a series or parallel element. We can again use the Darlington NPN transistor for that. The difference now is that the transistor is used in a common emitter configuration. For a Zener diode stabilization, it is even easier. We only have to turn the diode around and that's it. The far more common used circuit is the inverting switched mode power supply. It needs a positive input voltage and is able to give a negative output voltage. In addition, it can work as a buckle boost converter, which means it can make the output voltage larger or smaller than the input voltage. The design is similar to the normal step-up and step-down converter. At the input of the circuit, a capacitor keeps the voltage stable. The inductor of the inverting converter is connected to ground. Also we have again a MOSFET as active switch and the flyback diode as passive switch. The output capacitor completes the circuit. As a small reminder, we have two modes of operation. The discontinuous mode, where the current through the inductor falls to zero, and the continuous mode. We want again start our considerations with the continuous mode, the normal mode of operation. Also we treat our components as ideal. If the MOSFET is closed, the voltage over the inductor is equal to the input voltage. Constant voltage means a linearly rising current through it. Assuming the output voltage is stable at our desired value, the diode is in reverse direction and no current can flow through it. When the MOSFET opens, the inductor wants to maintain its current flow and the voltage across it changes its polarity. The diode is now in forward direction and the stored magnetic energy can be transferred into the output capacitor. The current of the inductor falls linearly. The equations for the ripple current are basically the same as for the normal step-up and step-down converter. If we combine them, we can see again that the output voltage only depends on the duty cycle of the switching transistor. We can see that the output voltage can be higher or smaller than the input voltage, depending on the duty cycle. If it is exactly 50%, the input and output voltage have the same value. For a better understanding, a small design example. We want to design a supply for a minus 12 volt system out of a 5 volt input. The switching frequency should be 1 MHz and the allowed ripple current of the inductor is 100 mA. The duty cycle can be calculated from the equation of the output voltage. For our example, we get the duty cycle of 0.71 or 71%. Now we can use our well-known formula for the inductor value and get the value of 35 microhenry. As we have already seen, the discontinuous mode changes the behavior of our circuit. During off time, the current through the inductor falls to zero. Therefore, we have to reconsider a few equations. 
With these considerations, we can derive a few characteristics for our converter. Short circuit protection, for example, can be easily done. The transistor is in the same place as in a step down converter, so we can just switch off the transistor. The gate control of the transistor is more difficult. Since it is not referred to ground, but to the inductor voltage, it has to adjust itself during the switching cycle. The input current of the circuit is discontinuous. That means high current during the on time and basically no current during off time. As mentioned in the video about step down converters, this is a big issue with electromagnetic emissions. We will talk a little bit later about PFCs to cover this problem. This concludes secondary switched mode power supplies. They are a lot more efficient than ordinary linear voltage regulators, but the premier league of efficiency are the primary switched mode power supplies. They use higher switching frequencies for their transformers, which leads to a smaller component size. There are two widely used types of primary switched mode power supplies the forward converter and the push-pull converter. They differ mainly in the control of the primary side, but their fundamental conversion principle is the same. To make things simple, we want to focus on the forward converter. It often uses the rectified mains voltage on its input, which is around 325 volt in Europe. The input voltage is connected over a MOSFET with the primary side of the transformer. If the MOSFET switches on, a current starts to flow into the primary winding. Due to its inductance, the current rises linearly and generates a magnetic flux. This flux again generates a current into the secondary winding. The value of the induced current depends on the turn ratio between the primary and the secondary side. The diode D1 allows the current to flow through the inductor on the secondary side and to build up a magnetic field in its core. If the transistor switches off, the stored magnetic energy in the transformer dissipates in heat. But since our transformer should have a high efficiency, this is not a lot. On the secondary side, the diode D1 is now blocking and the current of the inductor will continue to flow. Because of the inversion of the voltage over the inductor, D2 starts to conduct. Energy will be transferred from the inductor into the output capacitor. The transistor switches on and the cycle starts all over again. We get a rather easy connection between input and output voltage via the duty cycle of the switching transistor. The formula is similar to the one we derived for the secondary switched mode power supplies. The difference is the turn ratio of the transformer. We can see that depending on that ratio, we can generate higher or lower voltages on the output. Although the forward converter looks a lot like the flyback converter, it works on a different principle. As we have covered in one of our previous videos, the transformer in the flyback converter acts as a storage element, while at the forward converter it only transforms the current. Ideally, no magnetic energy is stored in the transformer itself. What makes this power supply principle so efficient? We are able to modulate and change the switching frequency of the whole circuit. At higher frequency, we can use a smaller transformer and a smaller inductor. This means less copper losses in the transformer due to shorter wires. Also, with smaller transformer size, we can use a ferret core. This material has lower losses in the high frequency region than normal iron. At the end, we want to have a short talk about power factor corrections or short PFCs. Because of the discontinuous input current of a few switched mode power supplies, the waveform of the input current is not a sine wave. This can lead to a few problems, especially with regard to harmonic disturbances of the main power line. A consequence is a higher amount of so-called apparent power, which only produces losses. There are regulations for the maximum amount of disturbances a power supply is allowed to emit. We want to tackle this topic with a rectifier a simple example. As we can see, a normal rectifier produces high load currents in a small amount of time. The current is far away from a sine wave. To dampen this high current peak, we can use active or passive power factor correction circuits. Passive PFC circuits are basically filters, which are optimized for the used frequency 
in our case 50 Hz. Because of the low frequency, the used parts are often big and bulky. They dampen the peak of the current a little bit, but not ideal. Passive BFCs are often used for low power applications. To get a better correction, active BFCs are used. Basically, we use a second switched mode power supply to generate a continuous input current, for example a boost converter. This converter loads an intermediate capacitor, which feeds the actual power supply. The discontinuous current of the second power supply does not affect the input current. The boost converter stage can also compensate changes in the input voltage. This is ideal if we want to use our power supply with different line voltages. We saw that there are no fundamental differences to non-inverting converters, just a few details we have to consider. Also we have seen that with a few simple tweaks we can improve the efficiency of the switched mode power supplies. I'm Christoph with the Institute of Electronics. We hope you've learned something today, but anyways, thanks for watching. For the interested viewer, we highly recommend The Arts of Electronics by Horowitz and Hill and for our German-speaking viewers, Elektronische Schaltungstechnik, written by members of our institute.